I was born out in the country, in the most marvelous, miraculous, and myrific nook of communist Romania. My tiny little village was the center of the world, the hub of the universe, my universe. For quite some time, I thought it had everything I needed. Although the only store, a shabby convenience store of the village, had its shelves almost always empty. I can still see the bare shelves and sense the smell of scarcity. Yes, communism has a smell. But in that little village, I felt home, and uh, everything there created a ramp and then a springboard into the future. The storekeeper was a remote, ready-to-retire relative of mine. His name was Uncle Wolf. That was his first name, not last name. I don't know why they gave that name to my uncle. But one of the high moments of uh, the country boy in that tiny little village was to grab a coin and uh, run to the store, to the convenience store, and get some candies. You didn't have much to pick from. A few bitter sour or uh, sweet sour drops, sugar drops. I don't know if you know what that looks like. It's something sticky, it's made of sugar, and it's sweet. What a treat for the child. Well, in those days, we had three kind of coins. We had the one lion coin, three lion, and five lion coin. Lion is the currency of Romania. Now, for one lion, you could get a few drops. For three lions, you could get, get some more. But five lion. The five lion coin, that was the coin to covet, the coin very hard to get. One day I got one. It popped out from under the couch. I looked at it. I looked around. Nobody was looking at us. I picked it up, tossed it in my pocket, and decided to give it a ride to the convenience store. <laughs> On my way down the road, I was thinking about it, and I didn't feel quite well about it. I didn't steal it. I found it, I told myself, but still. Now I'm there standing in the line, and right in front of me there's another kid he put his money on the counter and uh, tells the storekeeper, Mom sent me to get some oil. Huh, I thought. That's the magic formula. I would gladly use it myself. That was like music to the ears of the storekeeper, only that for me to use it now, that mantra would sound weird. But the storekeeper gave him what he needed, and it was me. 
I uh, quickly and uh, confidently tossed my fine-looking fat five lion coin on the counter and told him, please give me candies for five lions. He looked at me over his glasses like that and uh, asked me, who sent, who put you in the mail, son? I froze. I turned around, zoomed out through the open door, skittered down the stairs and vanished. To this day, I don't know what happened to my five lion coin. And I've been running ever since to this day when after 30 some years I'm standing in front of your counter looking at you, you looking at me, and I feel like facing the same question, who put you in the mail? Well, in my humanness, I would turn around right now and just run. Yes, because when you realize the huge responsibility of shepherding God's people, your first instinct as a human is to run away. But then I remember the one that put me, put me in the mail told me, whenever they ask you, you can rely on me and you can tell them who put you in the mail. You know, from a human standpoint, you can blame a few humans, the hands of a few humans. Pastor Park, the administration of Southeastern California Conference, the search committee. I want to grab this moment and uh, express my gratitude. Thank you so much for trusting me and entrusting us as a family with the shepherding of uh, this beautiful flock. Thank you so much. But, you know, I believe beyond those human hands that God has used, there is a much bigger sender. In the book of uh, John, the Gospel of John, first chapter, Gospel of John, first chapter, uh, first 18 verses, they are the prologue of that gospel. And uh, it's very interesting how they create a chiastic structure. A chiasm is a mountain-like structure. It has ideas running on both sides on the mountain, on both slopes, leading up to the main idea that is on the top of the mountain. It is right at the summit. Well, this morning, I would like us to look at those two passages that run on one side and the other, the ones in red. John chapter 1, Verses 6 and 8, 6 to 8, uphills, and then John 1, 15, downhills. Both of those passages speak about the mission of John the Baptist being sent as a witness to bear witness to somebody, or a testimony to carry or give testimony about somebody. And this is what it says. John chapter 1, verses 6 to 8 first. We are reading the passage on the uphill. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. 
And then verse 16, on the other side of the hill. Verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. I hope you've noticed that there is a contrast in the passage between Jesus and John the Baptist. Jesus was. John the Baptist just came. Jesus is eternal. John the Baptist is ephemeral. Jesus is that light. John the Baptist was put in the mail to bear witness to that light, to carry, to bring a testimony about that light. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you're standing in front of your word. And we pray that you will speak to all of us in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. There came a man. There came a man sent from God. His name was John. When somebody comes, the first thing that hits your eyes is his appearance or her appearance. When somebody appears, there is automatically a question in the back of your mind. What is that question? Well, the question is, where is he from? Where are you from? Or where are you coming from. Last night, uh, together with my beautiful family, we went to the, the ocean, and there we had Vespers with the school, and uh, I had a few people come to me, ask me where I was from, where I was coming from. I told them I was from Florida. <laughs> and they looked at me, and uh, they said, yeah, I, I see, but where are you really coming from? And I get that question. Now, you know, many people think that question is offensive. It's not to me. But it has not always been the same. When I was 14, I went to high school. And uh, you can imagine, there came... Uh, shaky and shy child from a small and simple country school and ended up in a large and lofty city school. That was quite a move. A move away from my family, a move out of my comfort zone, a move toward my unknown destiny and destination. But you know, the first day of school was wonderful. I know school started this last week, and uh, I hope it was a great start for everybody. It was a great start for me in high school. First day, I got to know a few people. I got, go, got to walk around, see the church building. Everything was fine, everything uh, fine and dandy. The next day, first class in the morning, the teacher in charge of the class, we called uh, her uh, classmaster, she came and uh, gave us a warm welcome to all the children. And then she said, all right, guys, let's see now where you guys are coming from. Please put your hand up if uh, you're from Zalo. Zalo is the name of the city where the school was. Most of my colleagues raised their hands. Then she went on and she said, Now please raise your hands, your hand if you're from another city. A few more hands went up. And then I knew it was coming. I knew it was unavoidable. She said, All right, how many of you are from the countryside? 
and silence. I wanted the floor to crack and open and swallow me. Then after a few moments of awkward silence, two of us raised our hands with blushing cheeks like this. It was us, the peasants, the rednecks. And we were ashamed of our origins. I don't know why. Because there's nothing wrong about it, really. And don't think the teacher wanted to know about our origin because she wanted to shame us. No. She was asking about origins, our origins, because she was interested in our destination. Indeed, there is something in your origins that can speak loudly about your destination. And this question, where are you coming from? Where are you from? Is a great question. It can be extremely helpful if somebody wants to help. Nothing wrong about it. It's extremely helpful if somebody wants to help. But what if this question is loaded with pride and prejudice? That's where embracing your origins, that's where knowing where you're coming from can become easily painful. And in one way or another, you all know what I'm talking about. Because, you know, we all come from somewhere. There is no way to go anywhere unless you come from somewhere. We as humans, we just come and go. He is. Jesus Christ is. We just come and go. And nothing wrong about it. But when people ask you where you're coming from, and uh, you, you feel that there is pride and prejudice and a stigma attached or associated with that place, then it's hard to embrace it. You know, quite often, people just look at our appearance. And that's the first thing that hits the eye. Your appearance. And quite often, based on your appearance... People can already approximate your origins and will already start making statements about your destiny, your destination. They just look at the envelope. They may not even ask who's put you in the mail. Just look at the envelope and say, oh, all right, okay, I don't like this. Mm. No. This is, I know where this is coming from. This is a, a mail coming from Nazareth. Uh, anything good can come from there. And you may think, Pastor, you picked the wrong envelopes. Listen, no matter who you are, one day or another, you will feel that. And that's when... It's crucial for you to know for yourself who's put you in the mail. Right? There came a man, the Bible says, there came a man sent from God. It's not anybody, it's not just a man, it's not just a woman, it's a man sent from God. This guy, John the Baptist, was not only coming from somewhere, he was coming from somebody. And when you come from somewhere, people may take you as an envelope, they don't even care who put you in the mail and just throw you away. Junk mail. Trash. And it will feel hard, it will torture your soul, it may even kill you unless you know who put you in the mail. This is what Ellen G. White says about John the Baptist in the book, The Desire of Ages, verse, uh, page uh, 100 and onward. She says, 
John was to go forth as Jehovah's messenger. Who put him in the mail? Jehovah himself. To bring to men the light of God, he must give a new direction to their thoughts. He must impress them with the holiness of God's requirements and their need of His perfect righteousness. Please notice, it's not about their own perfect righteousness. It's about His perfect righteousness. Then uh, she goes on, such a messenger must be holy. And again, this is not holy in the sense I'm sinless, I'm holy. This is a holiness in the sense I'm special because He made me special, because He put me in the mail. And then she, she goes on. He must be a temple for the indwelling Spirit of God. In order to fulfill His mission, He must have a sound physical constitution. Let me pause here. How good would it be, right, to have a sound physical constitution right now? Yes, he had to have a sound physical constitution and mental and spiritual strength. And then she goes on, therefore, it would be necessary for him to control what? The appetites? The appetites? Uh -huh. what, what, what you put in your mouth? Okay. Appetites and passions. He must be able to so control all his powers. All his powers. It's so uh, difficult sometimes to control all your powers. The muscle power, the brain power, the vocal cord power for those who sing. Yes, to control all his powers and so that he could stand among men as unmoved by surrounding circumstances as the rocks and mountains of the wilderness. The other day, together with my family, we crossed the wilderness. Can you imagine we passed almost two days in the wilderness? I didn't know America was mostly or mainly wilderness. So we crossed the wilderness, and I was reading this passage from uh, Desire of Ages when uh, we were in the area of the big mountains in the wilderness before you uh, come closer to the, the East Coast. And uh, I was looking at those mountains. Man, those mountains were standing unmoved, unmoved moved, strong and unmoved, firm and unmoved, high and unmoved. That's the mission of John the Baptist. In the time of John the Baptist, greed for riches, the love of luxury and displays, display have become, had become widespread. Sensuous pleasures, feasting and drinking were causing physical disease and degeneracy, benumbing the spiritual perceptions and lessening the sensibility to sin. And then it says, John was to stand as a reformer. By his abstemious life and plain dress, he was to rebuke the excesses of his time. When I read this description of the mission of John the Baptist, I can't avoid analyzing uh, the world today. And I came to the conclusion, this world needs John the Baptist. But I don't see too many John the Baptists showing up. I see probably more showing off. Here's the thing, mere appearance when it comes to the mission of John the Baptist is not enough. Something more is needed. The right accreditation is needed. Appearance, yes, appearance 
matters because the first appearance can convince or not somebody to even listen to you. But then the accreditation you carry. Who puts you in the mail? There are would-be John the Baptist, make-believe John the Baptist, fake John the Baptist, that have an appearance but lack the most important thing, which is accreditation, being sent from God. And here's the thing. If somebody comes only in the appearance of John the Baptist, but lacks the accreditation of John the Baptist. From this encounter with such a man, somebody that is deep in the darkness of his own or her own life, instead of coming out to the light, instead for the light to come unto him or her, that person will go even deeper in the darkness of discouragement, disappointment, distress, depression maybe, or despair. This is why it's crucial to not only appear, but also carry the right accreditation. Appearance, accreditation. Now, on the other hand, if somebody comes with the right accreditation, this is what the passage says, there came a man sent from God, his name was John. When somebody comes with the right appearance and carries the right accreditation, the name of that person, man or woman, will never be forget forgotten. Never. That person will have a name. You know, the Gospel of John was written at the end, toward the end of the first century. Do you realize that by the time when the Gospel of John was written, most of the people that knew, personally knew John the Baptist had died? Just remember, Jesus was crucified in what year? What year? 30? 1. Okay. And John the Baptist was beheaded before Jesus Christ was killed, before he died, right? So then if you, if you just do your math, you will see that at least half a century, more than 60 years passed from the time of, time of uh, the death of John the Baptist until this time when John the Evangelist, John the Gospel writer, John the Apostle wrote his gospel. Now watch this. In his gospel, the gospel writer, John, never ever mentions his own name. Whenever he speaks about himself, he calls himself in a peculiar way. Do you remember? He's the disciple that Jesus loved. But never says, hey, I'm John. Uh -uh. Why on earth, for some people that don't even know John the Baptist in person, is it so important for John the Apostle to mention, to point it out, to make sure you and I know that the name of the man sent from God is John? What's the point about it? Well, I got to know what the point was. When in 2005, I had the chance for the first time in my life to go to Africa. It was a beautiful country in Central Africa. We arrived uh, there, and uh, the next day after our arrival, we had a, an orientation meeting with local people. That's what they do when you go as a missionary, as a, an evangelist somewhere. They have an orientation meeting. So we were having this orientation, and... Uh, after the reunion, the meeting, uh, somebody came to me. Everybody was uh, just uh, sitting or standing around and, and fellowshipping, getting to know one another. And somebody walked straight up to me, looked into my face and said, Pastor, do you know Pastor Jay? Do I know Pastor Jay? Well, let me tell you about Pastor Jay. Pastor Jay is a pastor here 
in the United States. I'm not using his real name. He's a well-known pastor. Some people like him very much, some not so much. But that's beside my point. The reason I'm not saying his name is because this is not unique for him. But at that time, I was coming from Romania, from Romania to Africa. I had heard about this Pastor Jay. I knew he was here in the United States, but I didn't know him personally. So I turned to my inquirer and told him, Sir, I've, I've heard about him, but I, I don't know him personally. And uh, I could see a shade of disappointment on his face and that question in his eyes, how come you don't know Pastor Jay? Hmm, that was kind of strange for me. And I walked around and somebody else comes to me and uh, looks straight to me and uh, the same question comes. Pastor, do you happen to know Pastor Jay? Do I happen to know Pastor Jay? Well, you know, I have heard about him, but I can't say I really do know him. But now I was puzzled. But the third inquirer came right away. Pastor, you do know Pastor Jay, don't you? I said, oh my goodness. My, my, my blood started boiling, my blood pressure rising, and I said, what's going on with this guy? Who's he that I have to know him? And I do some research, and this is what I find. Hmm. A few years back, before we got there, Pastor Jay went to that country and did a huge evangelistic campaign in uh, one of the large cities there at the central stadium of the city. Many people got baptized at the end of that series. And one of the local leaders told me, see, pastor, I wasn't even a pastor at that time. See, pastor, these people that came to you inquiring and mentioning the name of Pastor Jay are the people that have been baptized by Pastor Jay. How come I don't know him? Well, listen. For somebody to whom God sent a man, and that man or woman brought on the light for them, that person is the man sent from God, and he or she has a name. There came a man sent from God. All right, and, and yeah, he, he's got a name. His name is John. Because here's the thing. Whether I know him or not, whether you like him or not, whether Pastor Jay is still alive or not, he is and will be the man sent from God for those people forever and ever. Amen. So see, John the Baptist is mentioned by name. John the Evangelist doesn't mention his own name. But you know, this name John is, is his name too. Yohanan, the grace of God, or God is graceful. Each one of us, or almost each one of us, is sensitive when it comes to his or her own name, right? It has a special touch. And, and here we are, uh, we have John the Baptist pointed out, well, John the Baptist actually is also the first master of John the Apostle, the Gospel writer. Because before becoming the disciple of Jesus Christ, John the Evangelist is the student, the disciple of John the Baptist. But that's not the reason why he mentions the name. He mentions the name because for him, there came a man sent from God. His name is John. You know, for somebody that gets an encounter with the light, there are two names that stay, that will remain sweet above all names. 
for the rest of his or her existence on this earth and even in eternity is the name of Jesus Christ the Savior and is the name of the man sent from God. So let me ask you something. How is it going with your appellative? Do people know you because you've been the man or woman sent by God for them? Appearance, accreditation, appellative. Do they call you in a certain way because you have brought on the light for them? See how crucial this is? To have the right accreditation that leads to the right appellative. Let me speak to you personally. You. There came a man sent from God. Can you put your name there? His name or her name was. And put your name there. You know, every single day, you walk up to the counter of your family members, of your neighbors, of your friends, of your work colleagues. Every single day, you place your values on that counter. And don't think nobody looks. They watch what you place on the counter. And with epoxy eyes, they also watch you. And while they are analyzing what you bring, what values you can bring into their lives, they are asking one question, who puts you in the mail? What's your answer? Let me address you as a body, as a church body. Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church, my church family. From now on, from this day on, we are on the same side of the counter. A counter that exists in the physical world. A counter that exists in the virtual world. On Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on TikTok, on YouTube, everywhere is a counter. And on that counter, physical or virtual, Everybody places all kinds of products, all kinds of values and pseudo-values. Just think about a counter that is full of all kinds of stuff. Because on that counter, the president places something. On that counter, the politicians place something. On that counter, government officials put something. On that counter, the CDC put something. On that counter, scientists and anti-scientists place something. On that counter, there are pro-vaccination and anti-vaccination products. On that counter, you can find the economy experts and uh, cryptocurrency speculators. All kind of stuff on the counter. And then you come, Laguna Niguel 70 Adventist Church, and you want to add your values Put your values on the counter and you want to convince this world that they will drop their sugar drops that eventually will kill them and embrace the real values of the gospel of Christ's kingdom. Who are you? Who puts you in the mail? And there's an answer to that. There came a man. A church body sent from God. Their name was Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church. That is our mission on this hill, on this side of the counter. Don't believe people here around are fed up. They have had enough of everything. No, there is famine out there. There is thirst out there. And we are bringing the values of the kingdom. The Sabbath, the law of God that gives you a better life and protects you. You bring the sanctuary message. You bring the natural mortality of the soul the three angels' message, you have already a fine-looking, fat, five 
lion coin. Put it there. And so many more. But no matter what you put on the counter, with bulging eyes, with epoxy eyes, this world will look at you and ask one question. Who put you in the mail? You know, I don't think there would be a better way to start this journey together than go back to the sender. God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ the Savior. God the Father also sent the Son, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Then Jesus Christ said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. I would like to invite uh, two of my very good friends, two great singers, to have this special moment together. We are going to sing that well-known song, So Send I You. Anybody knows that song? So Send I You. We'll sing it together. And uh, if you know the song, you can sing along. But I would like to encourage you to search your personal life and also the life of the body of Christ of this church and see if we've done anything effective and efficient in the past, what was that? If we have failed in something, what is that? And uh, listening to the words, to the lyrics of this song. Allow the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that moved John the Baptist, the Spirit that Jesus Christ left behind to carry out the work of the gospel of the kingdom. Let us just be imbued by the Holy Spirit, come back to the sender, and allow Him to take us again and put us in the mail so that we can go and place the values of the kingdom in front of people and when they look at us and ask us who put you in the mail we'll have the confidence the certainty the conviction that he sent us
Come share my joy.